Today, we're going to explore the fascinating world of attracting good luck into your home. Now, as we dive into this topic, know that our thoughts and feelings play a crucial role in shaping our reality. The first thing that attracts good luck in your home is the power of positive thoughts. As I often say, thoughts are the language of the brain. When you combine positive thoughts with positive feelings, you create a state of being that magnetizes good fortune towards you. Now think about it this way. Your brain is like a record of your past experiences. But when you focus your thoughts on positivity, you're not just dwelling on the past, you're creating a map for your future. Your brain becomes a guide directing you towards the luck and abundance you desire. So make it a habit to cultivate positive thoughts. Pay attention to what you're thinking and consciously choose uplifting and optimistic thoughts. This simple shift in your mental landscape can set the stage for good luck to flow into your life effortlessly. Moving on to the second key, emotional resonance. Your feelings are the language of your body. When you combine positive thoughts with positive feelings, you create a powerful resonance that shapes your experiences. Experiences tend to create long-term memories, and the emotional quotient helps us remember those events. So if you want to attract good luck, infuse your thoughts with positive emotions. Picture the joy, gratitude, and excitement that come with the realization of your desires. Imagine the feeling of receiving unexpected blessings and let that emotion resonate within you. Your body becomes a tuning fork, sending out vibrations that align with the frequency of good luck. This emotional resonance acts like a magnet, drawing positive experiences into your life. Let's take a closer look at the third key, and this one is all about attitudes, those little states of being that are like snapshots of how we think and feel. Attitudes are like the mood music playing in the background of our lives, and they play a significant role in shaping our experiences, especially when it comes to attracting good luck. Now, imagine your attitude as a combination of thoughts and feelings, working together like partners in a dance. If you consistently have a string of positive thoughts connected to positive feelings, you're basically forming a positive attitude. It's like having a sunny outlook that radiates positive energy around you. Think of it as a cycle of thinking and feeling. When you consciously choose to think positively, it creates a ripple effect in your emotions. This positive attitude becomes a guiding light, a beacon that attracts good luck into your life. It's like telling the universe, I'm open to positivity and good fortune. On the flip side, if your thoughts and feelings tend to lean more towards the negative side, it's like having a cloud over your attitude. This cloud can bring about challenges and obstacles because, in a way, your attitude is signaling to the world the kind of experiences you're open to. So, how do you cultivate a positive attitude? It all starts with being aware of your thoughts and emotions. Take a moment to pause and reflect. Are your thoughts steering towards the positive or negative? How do you feel in certain situations? Moving on to the fourth key, beliefs. Beliefs are thoughts that you keep thinking over and over until they are hardwired in your brain. They are based on past experiences and interestingly, the boundaries of our beliefs are determined by how we feel. Now, if you want to attract good luck into your home, you must examine and, if necessary, challenge your beliefs. Are your beliefs limiting your potential for good fortune? Are you holding on to beliefs that no longer serve you? By reshaping your beliefs through the repetition of positive thoughts and feelings, you expand the boundaries of what's possible. Your beliefs act as a blueprint for your experiences, and when you believe in the possibility of good luck, you open the door for it to manifest in your life. Let's take a closer look at the fifth key, an amazing tool called the power of visualization, or as I like to call it, mental rehearsal. This key is all about using your imagination to create a positive impact on your brain, and in turn, on your life. Now, visualization has two parts. The first is called internal mental imaging. That's when you close your eyes and imagine a scenario as if you're right there, experiencing it in the first person. The second part is external mental imaging, where you step back and watch yourself in the scene, almost like you're watching a movie. 
When you use mental rehearsal by picturing positive scenarios, especially from that first person perspective, something magical happens inside your brain. It's like your brain is doing a little dance of change. Even though you're not physically going through the situation, your brain reacts as if it's already taking place. Think of it this way. Your brain doesn't really know the difference between what's happening in the real world and what you're vividly imagining in your mind. So when you close your eyes and picture yourself surrounded by good luck and positive experiences, your brain believes it's real. It reacts as if you're already living that moment of good fortune. Here's the exciting part supported by scientific studies. Mental rehearsal can bring about actual changes in your brain structure, just like when you practice something physically. It's like you're planting seeds of positive experiences in your brain, and these seeds grow into new circuits. Now let's dive a bit deeper into the sixth key, understanding the biology of change. You see, your brain is like a big book that keeps all your memories and experiences. It's like a record of everything you've learned and felt in the past. But here's where it gets interesting. When you decide to make a change, you can actually reshape this record through a process called mental rehearsal. Picture your brain as a powerful tool that can be primed for change. When you engage in mental rehearsals, you're basically warming up the circuits in your brain with positive thoughts and feelings even before you experience something in real life. It's like getting your brain all set and ready to create a brand new reality. Think about it this way. Normally, your brain holds on to the past, keeping a detailed record of your previous experiences. But when you actively engage in mental rehearsals, something magical happens. Your brain is no longer just looking back at the past, it's now looking forward, creating a map for your future. Finally, let's explore the seventh key, stepping into the unknown. As you transition from your old self to the new, you might encounter resistance. The body has been conditioned to be the mind mind, clinging to familiar patterns even if they're not serving you. When you step into the river of change, your body may resist the uncertainty. It sends signals back to the brain, trying to pull you back into the comfort of your old habits and beliefs. But here's the thing, to attract good luck, you must be willing to embrace the unknown. Challenge those conditioned responses and consciously choose thoughts and feelings that align with the positive experiences you desire. 95% of who we are is a set of memorized behaviors and beliefs by the time we're 35. To invite good luck into your home, you need to break free from those unconscious patterns. Be aware of how you think, act, and feel. Consciously create a new reality by rewiring your brain through positive thoughts and emotions. So your thoughts and feelings are powerful tools for shaping your reality. By consciously choosing positive thoughts, cultivating positive emotions, and embracing the unknown, you can create a life filled with abundance and good fortune. People think self-love is getting a manicure or buying a sports car. That's not self-love, that's pleasure. Self-love is when you're sitting with yourself and you are working on overcoming your hardwired thoughts or beliefs or your emotional propensities that are connected to your past and you are really working to overcome them. Right on the other side of your pain is freedom. Right on the other side of your fear is courage. Right on the other side of your sadness is joy. It's the same energy. It's just trapped in the body. When you stretch yourself past that point and you break free from the chains of those emotional addictions, the side effect of that is called joy. The body is liberated from that level of mind. When that happens, there's available energy to create with. So when you break through that, you begin to love yourself. You begin to respect yourself. And you begin to love and respect others because you see yourself in them. And now that you're free from it, you can understand them with compassion without knee-jerking in the same way. So the difficulty here is really making the time to do it. And if you began to think about a new way of being and you moved into a state where you said, I'm not gonna get up until I am this person. Not only did you memorize it neurologically in your brain, but you allowed the thoughts that you were thinking to become the experience to the point that your body as the unconscious mind began to live in that future reality in the present moment. 
and when you got up when mind and body were working together in that state of being and you said I'm going to maintain the state of being my entire day and I don't care bring on the challenges because I want to test my greatness and you did that the entire day the end of your day when you finished your day more than likely you'd have more energy than when you started the literal translation of the word meditation in Tibetan means to become familiar with. The symbol means to become familiar with. So if you're becoming conscious of or familiar with your unconscious self to the point you're so conscious of your unconscious thoughts, so familiar with your unconscious habits, and so aware of your emotions that you would never let them go by unnoticed by you, there's no chance for you to return back to the old self, to know thyself. And then if you became familiar with a new self because you neurologically fired and wired it in your brain and you emotionally conditioned your body and you were able to do it enough times, sooner or later it would get easier and it would become more familiar to you and you would be able to move into that state of being. By the way, a new state of being is a new personality and a new personality is a new personal reality. One of the things about substances is that it actually helps to change chemistry in the brain and body. So there becomes a chemical dependence on it at that point. But the person who wants to change has to want to change. That's the first element. In other words, no one can make you change, but you have to find it in you to really see if this is what you want to do. I've studied people over the last 12 years. Why is it that one person, an old timer, can look at his x-rays and see a spot on his lungs and the doctor will say to him, hey George, you know that's a spot on your lungs. It's nothing now, but if you keep smoking, it will be. And that guy just takes his cigarettes, throws them in the trash and he's done the next day. How do you explain that? He made the decision and the decision was an experience and it began to rewrite his chemistry and his biology. How can a person who moves into a state of religious ecstasy, a state of absolute faith, drink strychnine and not get poisoned by it? It's a decision. It's an energetic decision. It's how powerful the mind really is. People then who actually want to make the decision to change have to make the decision with firm intention. Once you understand the how-to, that you can't use your conscious mind to do this, you have to move beyond the analytical mind. When you understand brainwave patterns, and when you slip into a different state of mind, that it's easier to do it. So most people then, you know, 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a set of memorized habits and behaviors that become part of our identity or personality. So 5% of the conscious mind is trying to change 95% of what we've memorized, hardwired, become addicted to emotionally. So the person may want to think positively, but they've been feeling negatively and oiling those programs for the last 25 years. They might want a new life with new conditions. And as they use their mind, conscious mind, to focus on that, their subconscious mind, they've been programmed to feel guilty. That's mind and body in opposition. We have to begin to recondition the body to a new mind. So change isn't hard. It's just that you've got to get the manual to understand how to begin to unlearn and relearn. To break the habit of the old self and reinvent the new self. The latest research in neuroplasticity tells us we're not hardwired to be a certain way for the rest of our lives. The latest research in epigenetics says we're not doomed by our genes, that in fact we're marvels of adaptability and change. So as a person started to contemplate and think about who do I want to be when I open my eyes, what would it be like to be happy? What would it be like to live a new life? The frontal lobe is looking out into the landscape of the entire brain because it has connections to the entire neocortex and it's got to resolve the problem. So it starts calling up different networks of neurons that are relevant to the question based on the knowledge the person learns or the experiences that they had. And it begins to seamlessly piece together this new understanding. And that's called intention. 
And so if you're reading a book about how to become more happy, or if you're reading a book on how to be a leader in your life, where you're studying the process, every time you learn something new, you add new connections to your brains and raw materials for you to imagine even more. The act of mentally rehearsing begins to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like it's already happened. Now the brain is typically a record of the past, but the moment we install the neurological hardware, it becomes a map to the future. And you keep doing that, the hardware becomes a software program, which means you start thinking like a genius. You start acting like a happy person because there's no mystery there, because you installed the circuits. And then these people didn't wait for their wealth or their health to feel gratitude and to feel empowered or to feel love, a love for life, they began to feel those emotions ahead of the experience and their body as the unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between the experience and their life that creates the emotion and their emotion that they're creating by thought alone. The body's believing it's living in the future in the present moment and the stronger the emotion that they felt, the more they're going to pay attention to the thoughts they're thinking and now all of a sudden they're changing their biology from living in the past present reality to living in the future present reality. And I was so intrigued by this process that I went back to school to study neuroscience because it was the answer in the internal process of rehearsing and imagining. They had long moments where they lost track of time and space, where when they opened their eyes, they thought it was maybe 15, 20 minutes later, and it was an hour and 15 minutes later. When we get into the present moment, there's a moment where you lose track of yourself, you forget about yourself, and only in the present moment do you have access, according to the quantum model of reality, to other possibilities. And when you're truly in the present moment, the generous present moment, that's the moment then that you are no longer living in the familiar past or the predictable future. And in order for us to change, I realized that we have to get beyond our environment and what's our environment made of. People, husbands, kids, bosses, objects, things, places. You gotta get beyond your emotions, your body, your pain, your disease, and you gotta get beyond this concept of linear time. So when we get beyond our body, our environment and time, we become pure consciousness. And now that consciousness can begin to connect to the consciousness of the field. And so if you're not there and you need a mirror or reflection, then it's good to ask, am I missing something? Am I not seeing myself in some way? And then there's a healthy conversation when you invite it. But if you're not invited to contribute your opinion, then it's better off that you don't, right? So people always say, I want a loving relationship, but what they really want is happiness really. So we, we do these meditations to create love in our lives. And, and it could be love in familial relationships with your siblings. It could be with your parents. It could be with your friends, or it could be with a significant other. And so if, if thoughts are the electrical charge in the quantum field, and feelings are the magnetic charge in the quantum field, and how you think and how you feel broadcasts an electromagnetic signature that influences every single atom in your life, the thought sends a signal out, and the feeling is the magnetic field that draws the event back to you, right? So if you're not in a place where you're in love with life or in love with yourself, or practicing diminishing your emotional reactions to certain people or conditions in your life, and you're living in anger or hostility or judgment or fear, and you want a loving relationship, there is no magnetic field for you to draw that to you. Hmm. And in fact, if you say to me, well, it's that person or that circumstance that's caused me to feel this way. And then I would say, I mean, that person or that circumstance is controlling the way you feel and the way you think. And anything that controls the way we feel in the way we think we are victims to, right? So most people are unconsciously responding to the conditions in their environment, experiencing emotions that are derived from the hormones of stress. Those emotions cause us to feel separate from our dreams. They heighten our senses. So if we can't see them, it doesn't exist. The threat or the danger puts us in emergency mode and we can think positively about the relationship we want. We could send the signal out into the field. 
We could have pictures, we could, have, we could remind ourselves of what it is, but if you're not drawing the experience back to you because your response to the environment is, is actually weakening your organism, it's weakening, your response is actually weakening the body, then you will be as a victim more vulnerable to the conditions in your environment. What are their large or small? And I'm talking about microorganisms as well. So if you wanted a true relationship where it was fundamentally based on this concept called love, now let's talk about that because we practice this a lot in the work that we do. Well, a habit is a redundant set of automatic unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions that's acquired through repetition. The habit is when you've done, done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it better than your mind. So if you think about it, people wake up in the morning, they begin to think about their problems. Those problems are circuits of memories in the brain. Each one of those memories are connected to people and things at certain times and places. And if the brain is a record of the past, the moment they start their day, they're already thinking in the past. Each one of those memories has an emotion. Emotions are the end product of past experiences. So the moment they recall those memories of their problems, they all of a sudden feel unhappy, they feel sad, they feel pain. Now how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So the person's entire state of being when they start their day is in the past. So what does that mean? The familiar past will sooner or later be predictable future. So if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny and you can't think greater than how you feel or feelings have become the means of thinking by very definition of emotions, you're thinking in the past and for the most part, you're going to keep creating the same life. So then people grab their cell phone, they check their WhatsApp, they check their text, they check their emails, they check Facebook, they take a picture of their feet, they post it on Facebook, they tweet something, they do Instagram, they check the news, and now they feel really connected to everything that's known in their life. And then they go through a series of routine behaviors, they get out of bed on the same side, they go to the toilet, they get a cup of coffee, they take a shower, they get dressed, they drive to work the same way. Nothing happened neurologically, biologically, chemically, hormonally, genetically. You're still in the same state of being. But when you get up and you feel like elevated sense of self, your heart is swollen and you have a clear vision of your future and your energy is different. The question is, how long can you maintain that state? So you're literally broadcasting a whole new electromagnetic signature in that state. Thoughts tend to be electric and feelings tend to be magnetic. The way we think and feel is what we broadcast into the field. And what we broadcast into the field is our experimental destiny. So then when you go within and you disconnect from your outer world and you sit your body down and it's no longer experiencing anything and you're not thinking about your schedule, your past, or your future. As I said today, you're being defined by thought and you're making your inner world more real than your outer world. When you open your eyes and you present yourself to the world, the job then is to not react emotionally to the same conditions in your life. Because the moment you react emotionally, you're equal to the conditions in your life and you're back in your past. So then when you fall from grace and you move off that state, then you sit down and you realign. You begin to tune in again and you change your energy again. Now when I'm going through change in my life, or I will have a specific outcome that I want to create, I love to get up early in the morning. That's my time. I'm a 4.30 in the morning guy because that's my time. The rest of the day I'm serving, but I love getting up early and changing and working and having some time to myself. And I believe that when I invest in myself, I invest in my future. And that time in my morning, nobody bothers me because that's my time. And because of brain waves and brain chemistry, the door between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind is more open. And so if I get up early and I'm kind of between theta and alpha, I don't have to work as hard. I'm not thinking, I just kind of relax into the moment. In the evening, I always ask myself, how did I do? How was one lifetime in one day? Where did I fall from grace? What happened? And so then when I look at seeing how I reacted to someone or something, or I made the choice that I could have made a better choice, 
I naturally, we all do this, begin to think, well, if the same situation happened again, how would I do it differently? And that's the act of beginning to come up with a new plan. The act of rehearsing it in your mind begins to install the circuits in your brain, priming your brain so that when the next experience happens, you could modify your behavior to do a better job in life. That's called plasticity. If you decide, okay, if I'm taking time out of my busy life to emulate the divine creator, then if I'm gonna create something unlimited, I better feel unlimited. If I'm gonna do something magnificent, I have to become magnificent. And if you keep doing that over and over again, it will begin to become more readily available to you. It'll get easier. And so when we're in that energy all the time, that's when the synchronicities and the serendipities and all those wonderful coincidences begin to happen. And it's those coincidences that are feedback in our environment where the field begins to open doors for us. That's what we want to occur. Now, I have worked on things in my life and I'm a sincere person. I've worked on things in my life for years and I always thought it was about the event or the experience I wanted to create. But all along, I was changing. And when I finally reached a point where I could care less if I could have the experience is the moment it happened. But all along, the divine, loving intelligence this mother-father principle, of course, it's observing us into life. It is, we are vitalistic, energetic beings that when we begin to unify all these principles that we're talking about, you can't get this in one sitting, you can't. You have to keep understanding it, keep reviewing it, keep redoing it, keep experiencing it. And new experience then causes you to dream in a way you would have never dreamt before unless you had that experience. And that's how God gets to know itself. So then I don't care what meditation you do. I just like the fact that you're connecting. And the more you connect, the more whole you feel, the more natural it becomes. Then of course, the next experience then causes you to dream in another way. And what I know from my own experience and many students, it's not about material things. It's about those mystical moments, those transcendental moments, those moments where your jaw drops and you are in awe of life, those moments that take our breath away, that cause us. And this has happened to me so many times. Every time I have one of those experiences, I think to myself, I got this all wrong. So now they've lost their free will to a program and there's no unseen hand doing it to them. So when it comes time to change, the redundancy of that cycle becomes a subconscious program. So now 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a memorized set of behaviors, emotional reactions, unconscious habits, hardwired attitudes, beliefs, and perceptions that function like a computer program. So then a person can say with their 5% of their conscious mind, I want to be healthy, I want to be happy, I want to be free, but the body's on a whole different program. So then how do you begin to make those changes? Well, you have to get beyond the analytical mind because what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. And that's where meditation comes in because you can teach people through practice how to change their brain waves, slow them down. And when they do that properly, they do enter the operating system where they can begin to make some really important changes. So most people then wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis. They wait for loss, some tragedy to make up their mind to change. And my message is why wait? And you can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. I think right now the cool thing is that people are waking up. Most people spend 70% of their life living in survival and living in stress. So they're always anticipating the worst case scenario based on a past experience. And they're literally out of the infinite potentials in the quantum field. They're selecting the worst possible outcome and they're beginning to emotionally embrace it with fear. And they're conditioning their body into a state of fear. Do that enough times, body has a panic attack without you. You can't even predict it because it's programmed subconsciously. 
So people become addicted to the rush of those emotions and they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their limitation so at least they can feel something. So now when it comes time to change, you say to the person, why are you this way? Well, every time they recall the event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as if the event is occurring. Firing and wiring the same circuits and sending the same emotional signature to the body. What's the relevance behind that? Well, your body is your unconscious mind. In a sense, if you're sitting down and you start thinking about some future worst case scenario that you're conjuring up in your mind, and you begin to feel the emotion of that event, your body doesn't know the difference between the event that's taking place in your world, outer world, and what you're creating by emotion or thought alone. So most people then, they're constantly reaffirming their emotional states. So when it comes time to give up that emotion, they can say, I really want to do it. But really the body is stronger than the mind because it's been conditioned that way. So the servant now has become the master and the person all of a sudden, once they step into that unknown, they'd rather feel guilt and suffering because at least they can predict it. Being in the unknown is a scary place for most people because the unknown is uncertain. People say to me, well, I can't predict my future. I'm in the unknown. And I always say the best way to predict your future is to create it, not from the known, but from the unknown. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors do you want to demonstrate in one day? The act of rehearsing the mentally closing your eyes and rehearsing the action. Rehearsing the reaction of what you want or the action of what you want. The action of what you want by closing your eyes and mentally rehearsing some action. If you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between what you're imaging and what you're experiencing in 3D world. So then you begin to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like the event has already occurred. Now your brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it's a map to the future. And if you keep doing it, priming it that way, the hardware becomes a software program. And who knows, you just may start acting like a happy person. And then I think the hardest part is to teach our body emotionally what the future will feel like ahead of the actual experience. So what does that mean? You can't wait for your success to feel empowered.